In this video, I will show you how I turned this 2D illustration into this 3D animation. The other day, I came across this mesmerizing 3D art by Matthew Brancini, and I've never seen anything like this before. The semi-realistic look along with the subtle movements all combined to make the art feel uniquely refreshing. But what got me truly interested was the fact that this 3D model was based on an illustration. I thought that this was such an exciting way to bring your illustration to life, and if you're like me, you're probably wondering, how was this done? So today, I'll be taking you through my journey of learning to model, animate, and texture. So hopefully by the end, you'll have the basic 3D knowledge to do something similar. So first of all, we need to choose an illustration to model after. If we look at Matthew's style, we can assume that the illustration should have a clear subject, a simple background, and maybe some foreground elements like leaves. This minimalistic approach results in a refreshing lo-fi outcome. So I could do that, or I could also go with one of my favorite illustrations by Mika Picasso. Where the character would be hard to model, the background is super complex, and the foreground is just wow. I just love the overall vibe of this image and thought it would look really great in this 3D style. Just imagine the hair and paint splashes flowing slowly together in the wind. So with the illustration chosen, I found out that Matthew started by modeling his characters using ZBrush. They exported them into Cinema 4D for composition and animation. Lastly, he sets up his lights and textured the model through Redshift. So that's what I'll also be doing to try and get the most authentic look. Alternatively, I think you can do all of this inside of Blender. The process will be slightly different, but there's a lot of great tutorials on each of these steps. So let's get started with learning how to model. Now you might be wondering, why do I already have a perfect anime head? Well, I didn't make it. Prior to this, I've spent three days following tutorials and trying to learn ZBrush, but it was much more difficult than I expected. I clicked on something, then I don't know how to fix it. I pressed on something, then I don't know how to fix it. There's weird hotkeys and a thousand new concepts like polygroups, dynamesh, topology. And that's when I found Sakaki Kaoru, a figurine artist and one of the best when it comes to character modeling in ZBrush, who also by chance made this Kaguya Luna figure the same character in this illustration. And lucky for us, he has downloadable brushes and base models, which was what I used here. And all I had to do was adjust the proportions by a little, as well as adding a mouth, eyelashes, and eyebrows. Next was making the pose. I imported in Sakaki Kaoru's model and added this thing called a C-sphere to create a skeleton underneath the model, which allowed me to bend the model into my desired pose. To make the clothes, I started by masking out specific areas, then extracting them out, smoothing them using polished sliders, and finally, decrease the details with CV Mesher. With that, we made this obi. Then I repeated this for the rest of the clothes. Honestly, I thought that making the clothes would be much harder, but turns out there were a lot of great tools which made this process straightforward. Still, ZBrush was very challenging for me. At this point, I was 5 days into ZBrush and I still can't zoom and rotate properly. For details, I used SK Cloth to try and recreate the folds in the illustration. Which made me look like an absolute pro when it comes to sculpting, but in reality, all I did was draw a single line. And here's how the model turned out. Next, I decided to add the hands. Same process for the body, I used C-Sphere to create a skeleton, then bent the hand into the desired pose. The hand is a little rough, but by using the smooth tool, we can easily fix this. Then I couldn't be bothered to repeat all that, so I just duplicated the hand and moved it to the other side. Again, the hard part was in the modeling. It was navigating Seabar's UI that was difficult. I probably wasted hours by this point, trying to find the same tools in this endless block of text. Here's how the body turned out. And I was really happy with this progress, but that happiness didn't last long. Because it's time for the part that I dread the most, the hair. And I don't even know where to start. The hair was being blown around by the wind, so it was really chaotic. I decided to first separate the hair into shapes to clarify which hair is which. This turned out to be a great decision that saved me a lot of time and sanity later on. For reference, I looked at this Kakuya Luna figure by Sakaki Kaoru. The reference was green and all, but I couldn't make out much from the image. It was a little small and I really want to see the other angles. Man, if, if only I could have a closer look. That was some great reference. From that, I finished separating the hair into groups and got started with modeling. 
I used SK hairbrush to create the hair strands, then shaped it using the same brushes with addition to SK crease and slash for details. And after a lot of time and efforts, this was the result. And that's great! One down and... Oh no. And after all of that, here's what I ended up with. Not wanting to look at this software for another second, I quickly exported each part as an OBJ out of ZBrush and into my 3D software of choice. Cinema 4D. I first set up the camera and positioned the character to look like the illustration. Then pressed render to see this. But then I tried adding this thing called an HDRI. And all good. How this works is, imagine placing the model inside of a real environment. The model will naturally catch the lights in the room. And essentially, the HDRI is the environment that the model is living in. And this was so awesome. With just one click, you got yourself the ambient light. However, I'm still missing a strong light that's coming from the top left of the image. So I added a simple rectangular light to mimic that. Although looking great, it's still missing some key elements. The splashes. Just look at this. How am I... Sp I don't know. Now, at this point, I could either... A. Go back to ZBrush and model each individual splash. B. Learn how to model them in Cinema 4D. C. Use cloth simulation to turn them into a flowy ribbon. That way, I wouldn't have to do much modeling. Or D. Just find something similar online and download them. So, which one do you think I... And that's right, I went with option E. I traced the shapes of the splashes, turned them into black and white images, imported them into this website called Monster Mash, and have it automatically turn the PNGs into 3D objects. Then put it back into the scene. And I'm so glad that this worked out, and that I don't have to do any more modeling. Also, seeing everything come together for the first time, is very satisfying. But now, it's time to do the animation. What I'm trying to go for is this subtle, minimalistic, looping animation. The kind of animation that makes you go... <sighs> but in order to do that, I first had to figure out how to animate these 3D objects. Judging from Matthew's work, I assumed that the model was probably rigged, which allowed the head to rotate back and forth. But then, what about the hair? How do you make it react to the movement of the head? There wasn't a lot to go by, and all I saw were strange words like soft body dynamic, class simulation, IQ rig, FK rig. What does any of this mean? And which one should I choose? But then, I saw this tutorial. This was a game changer. It was a tutorial on how to animate using joints or IK rig. This method works by adding joints to your model and giving it physics. Now the whole thing can be moved, bent, and wobbled around. I will go into more details later on, but for now, I think we got the same effects as Matthew's work. For deeper insights into animating, I watched this tutorial by New Plastic. What I want was for the hair to rotate back and forth. So what I did was keyframe the selected joints individually, rotating each axis separately, and animating it down. Now you can go ahead and start keyframing each joint individually and animate it that way, but you'll be wrong. It's not the way to do oh. it. It's not oh. only impractical, there's also so much room oh. for errors and mistakes. So what you want to do is you want to create a pose morph tag by right clicking on the topmost All joint right, of the Never line. mind, we're using pose morph now. How I used this was I added a pose morph tag, then created two poses. First was the hair at its normal position. Second was where I wanted the hair to end up. Now I can make it so that the hair moves back and forth between the two poses. This way, I don't have to slowly keyframe the X, Y, and C position individually, which was what I initially did, so this method saves me a lot of time. To make it loop, I copied the first keyframe and pasted that right at the end. To summarize, what I did was this five-step process. First, set the point of rotation, create the joints, Then highlight your models and joints, and go to bind settings. I change the mode to distance, and set the joints to the amount of joints that I have. 
add an IK tag. Then tell the program the endpoint and adjust the physics. Then disable the gravity. Lastly, add the postmorph tag and start setting the post and keyframes. As you can see, it's not difficult at all, just very time consuming. And that's it for the first hair. And once it was done, what I got was this. The movement was way too uniformed, so I ununiformed them by moving the keyframes randomly. Not the smartest solution, but at least the hair now has some randomness. For the body, I wanted it to float up and down while mimicking breathing patterns. But before that, I first have to attach the hair to the head and the head to the body, which can be done quickly using a constraint tag. And here's how the animation turned out. And here's with the splashes, which although looks complicated, was also rigged the exact same way. Instead of trying to replicate Mika Picasso's insane coloring techniques, I went for a different approach. I saw Tsukima Sangyo's figurine in making videos, and loved the way that he used airbrush to create soft gradients. So that's what I'm aiming for. The first render attempt looked really sad and empty. My guess was that this empty feeling was caused by the overblown lights. So I moved the bathroom HDRI around to where it's less intense, which gave the image more contrast, but now I have to add more lights to match the original illustration. As you can tell, this stage was all about tweaking the lights and texture, going back and forth until the textures and lights work together. In case anyone's wondering, here's my material properties. And that's looking great, but it's still missing something. <laughs> of course, the iconic anime cheek blush. I first tried painting the model using Cinema 4D's body paint, which didn't work out for me. But what it did do was gave me this weird mesh thing. This mesh thing is called a UV map, which I don't know much about. But basically, it's the 3D model when unfolded. And this is huge. This means that you can control which parts you want to paint. So I brought this into Photoshop, drew the blush, and put it back onto the model. Last thing to texture was the hair. To make sure some parts remain white and some purple, I unfolded each hair to get the UV map. Then I'll paint them in Photoshop. Now all I have to do was save this and put it back into Cinema 4D. Once done, here's how it turned out. Last thing to do was to see how it looked with the animation. <sighs> it's pretty much perfect as long as you don't know about the mistakes that I'm hiding. Like how there's a straight line in the clothes, and how I couldn't actually make it loop, so I faked it in After Effects. But you'll never know that, so it's pretty much flawless. Last thing to do is the color correction. All I did was bump up the saturation, adjust the hue, and increase the contrast by a little. I was trying my best to keep the colors as close to the original as possible. Mika Picasso's illustration also has depth of field, chromatic aberration, and this wavy smoke effect which I tried replicating. Looking back, I bit off way more than I could chew with this project. It's honestly a miracle that I managed to get to this point. From the intense sculpting session, to seeing it all come together in composition, to learning the hellish rigging process, and then bring it all to life through texturing. I'm happy with how this turned out, and I can't wait to show you the final outcome. If you want to see the files for yourself, the download link is below. Knowing basic 3D can help us broaden our perspective, opening up new exciting ways of bringing your illustration to life. Like Blob, who creates amazing 3D contraptions that fuse with his paintings. More recently, Yonayama Mai, who makes 2D illustrations with 3D forms, offering viewers a fresh and unique viewing experience at her exhibition. If you have any artist that combines 2D with 3D that you want to see a breakdown of, feel free to leave it in the comments below. Thanks for watching.